So. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait. This is not uncomfortable, but it's very weird. This is the thing? This is the one. Absolutely. And now it almost couldn't have happened in a better way. Where did you want to be? So it was just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> am I funny? Now if I go over here, am I still funny? Better strategy. Yeah, a way better strategy. I never thought about that. Yeah, yeah. it's a work. I don't see it five years from now that you're not my most famous friend. You really have to commit to something. Good to have something pushing you. That's that cool. That was really cool. Yeah, it might be cool. This is On The Cusp. Hello, I'm Ben Green and welcome to On The Cusp. This week, my guest is Jessica McKenna. She's an improviser on the UCB Herald team, Dunk Tank, an actress on the UCB mod team, New Money, and she's appeared on shows like Riot, The Goldbergs, and Comedy Bang Bang. If this is your first time listening to On the Cusp, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the show. New episodes are released every other Thursday, and you can find them on Stitcher, SoundCloud, and on iTunes. This episode is sponsored by Ty Pepper at 6219 Franklin Avenue. Now's a great time to head over to Thai Pepper as they're celebrating Joe Mart month all through the month of May. That's right, the Joe Mart, stationed right next to Thai Pepper, is the go-to place for all your convenience needs in the Franklin Village area. And for this month only, Thai Pepper customers who bring their Thai Pepper receipt to the Joe Mart can get a plastic bag to hold your groceries for only 10 cents. Hurry now, because supplies are going fast. Thai Pepper, it's the only Thai food restaurant within 10 feet of the Joe Mart. It's Thai Pepper. So my guest this week, Jessica McKenna, is a force to be reckoned with. I feel like in 2012, she went very quickly from being someone who was relatively new to Los Angeles, known within the indie improv community, to someone who everyone knew. She's just got an amazing brain, and it's kind of crazy to see how fast it goes when she's doing a Herald or doing musical improv. It's crazy to me to see on our sketch team how soon after a read-through she'll have all the sketches memorized and have made awesome, strong choices. And then I'll go on the internet and see a new video from her sketch group with Zach Reno, and they're always inspiring and make me really hungry to make stuff myself. She's another person who has a lot of people believing in her because she's proven herself in front of her peers again and again in a variety of ways. One thing I really enjoyed hearing about in my interview with Jess was how much she loves TV. She owned the fact that she can consume hours and hours of TV, that she's always loved doing that, and she just feels passionate about the medium. I relate to this in a big way because growing up, I also couldn't get enough TV. Uh, when I get home from school, I would watch the Disney afternoon for two hours. Then I would watch a bunch of Nicktoons. And then I would watch whatever my parents were watching. I watched hours and hours of TV in a row, and I loved it. I often dreamt in the form of cartoons, literally. I had cartoon dreams. And then when I went to college, I started to get embarrassed by how much of a TV watcher I was. And I kind of tried to cover it up. Um, I didn't watch a lot of TV through college, and when people would ask me, I would say that I didn't love TV. So it was really cool to hear a comedy pro like Jess McKenna owning the fact that she loves TV. Because the fact of the matter is, I do too. And hearing somebody like her say it makes me feel like a little bit more okay to own the fact myself. So here it is, my interview with fellow TV lover and all-around awesome person, Jessica McKenna. So our weddings have been very close to each other, right? Like a yeah, week apart. Week apart. Uh, are you feeling overwhelmed? Like about a month away from it happening? Um, I can't, I don't think I feel any more overwhelmed than I have since like I don't know maybe February. I feel like gotten a new year and it started being like okay, almost every week there's something to cross off the list, and now I'm at a point where. It's becoming hard to do, like, non-wedding things. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have a very open schedule right now, and I have found myself in the last two weeks just, like, sitting in my apartment watching a lot of, like, reality TV, 
unable to focus on like anything creative and just like slowly chipping away at our like last detail stuff and it's crazy so that I didn't you know like you don't think about when you're super far out like hey we need a sign to describe the signature cocktail <laughs> what size do you want that to be so are you gonna buy a picture frame for it and it's like yeah I guess so I guess 8 to 10 and now I'm gonna go like get a bunch of 8 to 10 frames you know like <laughs> that level of like minutia that's like oh boy but I don't think I feel like extra overwhelmed I'm just getting to a place where I'm like gonna give myself license to not be able to accomplish anything else that's smart has there been a biggest single thing about the wedding like tablecloths or (laughs) um right now we've been in a real um like music phase where it was like like it took a lot of back and forth with my dad and I decided what we wanted to dance like picking songs for certain moments and we still have to like pick firm up like what's actually happening in our ceremony that kind of stuff is still like I feel like that's, and that's like huge stuff. Oh, it is, but I feel like you know how to put on a show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing. It's like, oof, there's a lot, and he, he's really good about this, about like, hey, what well, what is like reflective of us in this moment? Like, what could we have as a reading that would really like ring true to us and isn't just like, this is a standard issue wedding. Yes. I feel like that falls on me a lot, too, in our wedding, while Madeline, like, handles huge numbers of logistical yeah. <laughs> things. Yeah, and, oh, boy. Yeah, there's a lot still to do. Um, did you, like, clear your slate just for this? The wedding? Yeah. Or, I mean, like, did you, like, did you decide to take this month fully off for this? Or, like, did, because, like, Nickelodeon just ended pretty yeah. naturally, right? Yeah. Yeah. What and, were you doing in Nickelodeon? Um, I was part of a writer's room that was writing sketches for Nick, Nickelodeon.com that um, would use current on-air talent, and that was really fun. It was, like, on and off. It's sort of been since last April, April of 2014, and then it was, like, pretty loosey-goosey until the fall when we got, like, official staffing contracts, and so we did... But it's still only two weeks a month and very flexible hours. So it's odd that its absence is, like, making me feel like I have no structure. Because I feel like it didn't add, like, it's not like it turned into a 9 to 5. You know, it was, like, two weeks out of the month, 11 to 4. <laughs> I got to miss if I needed for auditions. It was the best job ever. Yeah, it feels um, like the perfect game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, some of that is still continued. Like, like uh, Zach and I are, like, still working on some stuff for Nickelodeon, but not in any sort of, like, regular capacity. So... Um, it happened naturally that May just has like been kind of open and I am sort of like preemptively like if someone's like can you do a show May 22nd I'm trying to be like no yeah that's very smart uh no I don't think so but like for no other reason than I'm just like I don't know what my brain's gonna be like what's the level of ask that like would actually you'd have to say yes to because it would be too good of a thing to pass up that would be in May or, like, actually conflict with, like, a real day of the wedding? That would get, like, dangerously close. Like, obviously, you say no to everything I'm saying around no to, wedding, like, I'm saying no but, to, like, indie shows. You know, like... But, like, okay, let's say... So, your wedding is... June 6th. So, it's on June 4th. Uh-huh. You get offered to um, do the pilot uh, for a new show. Oh, yeah, definitely. That, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, I think, like... If it was shooting something, like, really legit, I, I would obviously still move stuff for that. Except for, with the exception of it being on our actual wedding day, I, I think, like, it'd have to be, you're starring in a movie, we can't move it. And then I don't know what I would do. Elope? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Like, I don't know what the solution there is. That would be, like, a huge, God, I hope that doesn't happen. But, um, but no, I mean, like, all those dates are booked out. You know, the, the first whole first week of June and the second week because we're going on a honeymoon immediately. So those are like... To where? Costa Rica. That's great. We're going yeah. to Cancun. Oh, nice. Those aren't far, right? Um, well, well, where is Costa Rica? I don't know. Uh, Costa Rica is like Central America. Okay. Um, so those aren't far like... No, no, Like no. New York isn't far from California. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's generally in the same Yeah, they're in the same area. Are you guys going right after? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like the day after. Yeah. Nice, right? It'll be fun. I, I get why people put it off, but I'm also like... I want to just go. Because I think with the kind of schedules we probably both have, it could get very easy to put it off forever. Yeah, exactly. 
And, like, I understand when people are like, we want to put it off so then we can take three weeks. But I don't think I could ever take three weeks. Or he couldn't either. So it's like, well, let's just take one right right away. Come back to L.A., get rich and famous. Yeah. And then eventually take a four-month vacation. Yeah, exactly. When we just are, like, living a life of luxury. Yeah. <laughs> um, so were you born in Orange County? I was, yeah. And what were your parents doing when you were born? I'm the youngest of three, so they were, like, you know raising my brother and sister um my dad works in insurance um in a capacity i still don't fully understand uh managed care (laughs) question mark but what's what's the most you understand about it oh boy um i know that he mostly deals with like hospitals um and that he sort of like is not that many people that that's like hard I know he's sort of, like, big in his area. Got to the point where he, like, not geographical area, but, like, the area of managed care. Um, And that he, at one point, like, built his own business, McKenna and Associates, and then sold it to Aon, which is a very huge company. Um, That's all I'm, and that he's, you know, he's, like, he travels a ton, and he's sort of, like, a businessman baller. Well, traveled enough that, like, he was away for, like, parts of your childhood? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not, like, not, like, away, like, oh, he's gone for a month, but, like, in any given week, he probably was almost never there all seven days. Right. Um, and then you were with your mom? Mm-hmm. Or babysitters? And mom, stuff? yeah. Okay. Mom, they met working at a Marie Callender's. My mom was the manager. My dad was a <laughs> busboy. Uh, they got married pretty young. They were um, both 21. And uh, neither of them went to college or they, you know, they both went to like a little bit of community college. Um, They're both uh, in big families. My mom is uh, the third of six. My dad's the eldest of five. Um, Wow. My dad is an immigrant family. It's like neither of their families had like a ton of money. um, So college wasn't like a huge thing for them. Um, My mom like worked since she was like 13. And um, then she managed the restaurant through my brother and sister being born. You think it was scandalous that your mom as a manager was dating a busboy? I don't think so. I've never heard any scandal discussed. (laughs) Um, I think it was like... Like lightly. (laughs) Like like light scandal. Um, Yeah, I know that she originally thought he was like a smart aleck. Um, But I don't don't think it was... I don't know how scandalous it was. And they didn't date very long. And then my mom went backpacking in Europe with her friend for like three months and came back and they got engaged. So I think... When I was born, my mom might have still worked for, like, another year. And there's some confusing story about her, like, falling asleep while I was in the bathtub or something and her being like, I can't work anymore. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess she was still working a little bit for, like, maybe my first couple of years. Of, and my grandmother used to babysit me a lot. But then she quit. And then so ever since I was, like, two or three, she was a stay-at-home mom and, like, real good at it. And how close are... You, like, you now to, like, what you were, like, as, like, a kid from, like, three to ten. Very same. And what are the similar qualities? <laughs> very, <laughs> this very same sameness. kid. Uh, like, I feel like I'm definitely, like, sort of a childlike person. So, I think literally I just feel, like, the same as I was when I was, like, that I identify with a lot of, like, things about being a kid. Uh, You feel like you're looking at the world with very similar eyes? Yeah, like, hopefully I like that part about myself, which is, like, remembering to look at the world with wonder and um, being playful. Um, I was a very... My brother and sister are awesome and, like, uh, overachieved in their own ways, and so I was definitely, like, trying to make a name for myself, which led to me being, like, a bit of an overachiever, which was, like... In co- like trying to push against like what they had already done, um, I was like always trying to know big words so that I could like use them and impress people. Um, like I remember in Mrs. Doubtfire, the little girl says that's the most revolting thing I've ever seen, and I was like, "What does revolting mean?" And they're like, "Disgusting." And then I would work any conversation <laughs> around so that I could say revolting. Um, uh, there's also, like, stories of me using words where I didn't quite know what they meant yet. Like, um, we were driving through a Carl's Jr. I remember there was something on the radio about a man being so fat that he had to be cut out of his home to be taken to the hospital. Uh-huh. 
And I said, geez, what did his parents feed him? Hemorrhoids? But- <laughs> Thinking steroids. Which, which is like, that, what a great <laughs> But what a great, oh God, feed that guy hemorrhoids. Uh, so I was always trying to keep up. Um, I, that would have also made him fat. Yeah, yeah, like maybe. <laughs> it would have been very weird. <laughs> very weird, very weird. Um, but uh, I feel like I was very much the same person. I mean, I think hopefully... I had, like, a little bit more of a temper when I was a kid, so hopefully I've gotten that under control. Um, like, things used to really frustrate me a lot more easily, I think, when I was growing up, a little, a little more hot-headed. Um, but other than that, I really feel like I'm really the same. What were your favorite things to do? My mom kept us, like, very busy. Um, I had, as long as I can remember, I had stuff after school all the time. I didn't have, like, a ton of free play time. Um... I had something all always, um, and, uh, but I did like playing make-believe, and I, I, in the first house we lived in until I was, like, six, I had a next-door neighbor who was, like, two years older than me, but we were just, like, such pals, and we had this giant hedge on the side of my house that you could get inside of, and we would play, like, endlessly in there, and we called it Lost Boy's Cabin, and he would be Peter Pan and I would be Rufio. And uh, we would just like, we would start out like elaborate act out games, with, but start by describing what we were wearing, including like <laughs> some of the other kids on the cul-de-sac, or it wasn't a cul-de-sac, but the street, it was a great, great street. It was like so, every house had kids and we all played. Like all the way up to my brother who's six years older than me. It was like from me to my brother, all the kids in between, we would like play this like hide and seek hybrid called Run For Your Life. We would, like, you know, uh, hmm. play, like, games where we were all on a deserted island. And that's, I remember, we would all start by talking about what we were wearing. <laughs> I remember this one girl down the street. I remember, like, her so vividly being, like, and I have um, bangles just all the way up my arm. And I was, With, like, Whoa. basically a scene painting. Yes, exactly. We're, like, scene painting what we're wearing. And then we would, like, actually, but it was, like, such that neighborhood where everyone's playing. You go in for dinner. You go back out. And I was the youngest on the block, but... And I feel like that really is part of what my whole experience of growing up was, was like usually being the youngest. And that was very informative of like, okay, what's it like to be the baby? I loved being the baby. I relished my position in the family. And I also like, <clears throat> I'm always looking up to people. I'm always like, so I think that you made me talk early. It made me like have a bigger vocabulary. It like really pushed me to like want to keep up. So, um, yeah, we played. I, like, loved playing. Uh, but I was always, like, I was already in, like, piano lessons to, like, you know, music and movement when I was, like, really little, which was just, like, a baby class or <laughs> you, like, ran, galloped and sang songs. But, um... Piano was the big after-school activity or there were others, too? I mean, I did, like... I remember starting in elementary school, I'd have, like, a piano lesson. I'd either have soccer or softball, depending on the season, dance classes um starting in fifth grade I was also in voice lessons uh girl scouts once a week and then also ccd which is like catholic classes very well rounded (laughs) yeah I mean and like that from like first grade not like later in life did you have an opinion on the like on your catholic upbringing as like a fifth grader as was happening as was happening no not really I mean like orange county is very religious if anything like it was a little weird to be Catholic. Most people were Protestant, which would come to head a little bit more in high school. People would be like, oh, Catholicism, you're like going to hell because you worship Mary. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> like, you realize that like, there's like a thousand years or there's more of like the only existence of Christianity is Catholicism. It was so bizarre to me that people would like, I'm like, that's what you want to pick fights over is like what type of Christian I am. Yeah, that's very weird. <laughs> so weird. And they would do the same thing with like, the, I grew up in a big Mormon population. And I was like, this is not where you should be focusing your energies. Good li- goodness. <laughs> like, feed the poor. Or like, talk to someone who doesn't believe in anything, I guess. You know, like, uh, I didn't like CCD very much. I thought it was a little bit boring. But um, I also, like, there were tests and stuff and I like, studied, like I treated it like school. Were you a big reader? No. As a kid, were you a big TV watcher or yes. movie watcher? So what were your things that you liked to consume? I just, I just watched so much TV. Like, I've, I've heard this with other people, like, you know, youngest don't get parented as, as strictly. I just, like, watched so much TV. I just, like, 
I still watch so much TV. And I do sort of have this feeling of, like, scoreboard. Like, <laughs> it didn't mess me up, you know? Like, right. <laughs> it didn't really affect anything um, except for that, like, I love television. And put you in a very, <laughs> like, actual path towards yeah. being on TV. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just, like, love it. And I'm, like, sick of the haters, you know? Like, uh, it's a great medium. It brings people together. It's, like, doing amazing stuff right now. It's awesome. I love television. And, um... I guess maybe there were rules when I was little about, like, school night consumption, but I feel like I spent entire summers in front of the television. <laughs> you know, like... Not playing video games, too, just watching no, TV. just watching TV. And were there shows, like, you felt pretty strongly about? Like, we loved, loved? Well, I do, as I'm sure is, like, the case with a lot of people. I mean, The Simpsons is, like, the single most important show. Um, I have a lot... Sense of humor-wise... This has sort of st- stopped being as much the case, but definitely growing up, I was in sync with my brother and not my sister. And I, every Sunday night, I feel like our family ate dinner, and then we had to watch 60 Minutes, because that's what my dad wanted to watch, and I hated <laughs> it. And you just had to, like, wait through it, because it was like, that was, like, one of the shows a week dad got to pick, so we all just had to wait through 60 Minutes. And I remember being so excited when Andy Rooney would come on, because it meant it was almost over. <laughs> Also, how I felt about church and communion it was like when communion comes, you only have like five minutes left. So it was like my Sundays were had these two hour blocks that I found boring, but both of them had little <laughs> communionists to Andy Rooney. Um, uh, and then we would watch The Simpsons, and I remember being like, my sister didn't get it and hated it, and it made her feel bad, which I feel bad about. Um, but she grew out of it, and she just like she admits herself that she like was a late bloomer in terms of her sense of humor. Now I think she has, like, a great sense of humor, and we, like, have other parts of our sense of humor that we have in common. We're both, like, silly, and we laugh at the same stuff. But it was, like, a source of pride for me as, like, a six-year-old looking at, like, her 12-year-old brother that we could laugh at the same thing. Or my dad, like, an adult, like... And I don't know how much I was always getting, but it was, like, we all are laughing at The Simpsons. This feels great. (laughs) But you have good taste. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, I have good taste. I'm a kid. <laughs> this show is great. Yeah, you're... <laughs> and then other than that, it was like a ton of Nickelodeon. You know, like, basically just... I, I think I had the Nickelodeon schedule memorized. And I would, <laughs> I would watch shows even though I didn't like them. Like, I didn't remember, I didn't love All Real Monsters, but Me I'd be either. like, I'm going to sit through it because after it's Hey Arnold, and I love Hey Arnold. It's almost like you have to watch Real Monsters just to, like, keep up <laughs> yeah. with people. Yeah, I was like... Wanna... I mean, I thought it was fine. But I was like, it's kind of gross. I don't like the way the animation looks. It's scary. But I'll watch it because Hey Arnold's next. And like, <laughs> what else am I going to do? I loved Doug. Yeah, Nick cartoons. I would say like I loved watching Simpsons. And then eventually like I guess we were pretty young when Friends first came on. And I feel like I watched every episode of Friends. But and then other than that, it was just like a ton of Nickelodeon. I relate to all that very <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah, it was great. My my sister in law like sometimes will say like I'm worried that I let the uh, my nieces and nephews like watch too much TV and she's like but then I'm like you turned out good and you watched a ton of TV <laughs> yeah I'm like I really did I watched like so much I don't know I had like an endless capacity to watch the same episode of Friends like over yeah. and over yeah and I feel like it should come in like handy now like do you ever feel in Nickelodeon meetings like like that it counts for something that you've seen every episode of Doug? No. I mean, (laughs) uh, it was kind of fun because I do feel like, you know, we will watch, like, as people from our generation start, like, working at things like Nickelodeon, you will see, like, a pendulum swing back to, like, our era, which I think was really amazing. Not to say that they don't have good programming now, but, like, I really feel like there was so much cool, risky, weird stuff on Nickelodeon when we were growing up that I feel like definitely has informed a whole generation of taste of like being okay with the absurd um and uh yeah I don't regret I mean I must not have watched that much TV because my mom would still like but I was so self-motivated it's not like my mom had to be like turn off the TV and do your homework I just always did it myself um and so I feel like as long as I had the balance like no one questioned it because like the results were good and then you know summers and weekends were just a different story it was like 
okay, you have a really busy weekend, then I'm obviously not watching a ton of, ton of TV. But that would just happen naturally. Oh, I have, like, a soccer game, and then I, like, I have the play tonight, or I have, like, a voice competition. So I'm obviously not parked in front of the TV. Or in summers, like, my mom made me go to, like, camps and stuff. Like, oh, I'm in, I'm not watching TV while I'm at, like, computer camp or soccer camp or art camp or <sighs> music camp or whatever. But there still are, like, whole huge chunks of the summer I remember just, like, that almost disgusting feeling of sitting on the couch all day. Yeah. I definitely had that a lot. <laughs> and I looked forward to getting it again. Yeah. I was like, that's great. And we had a pool. Like, <laughs> there were great things for me to do outside. But I was like, uh, I'd rather watch eight episodes of <laughs> Saved by the Bell. Yeah. And when did doing theater come into your life? Um, Still through television. No, um, through a movie. <laughs> I through what? A movie. I saw Little Rascals as a child. And Ooh. you said, I must perform. Honestly, I was like, Mom... I want to be, like, I don't know if anyone here also watched. Anyone here in this crowd of people? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't know if other people, like, watch that movie in nauseam, but I watched it a lot, and there are bloopers at the end, and the girl who plays Darla, they constantly have to tell her not to look at the camera. They're like, don't look at the camera, sweetie. Don't look at the camera. Don't look at the camera. And I remember watching that and being like, you would only have to tell me once. (laughs) You know, like, I was just like, I could have done that. You know, if you told me not to look at the camera, I w- you would never have to ask me again. And Which I'm- is the thing I've, like, seen you, like, <laughs> just, I've seen you perform most in New Money. And, like, you, like, do everything so, like, you're such a big pro. Oh, uh, and thanks. that, like, always comes through all the time. Thanks. So I feel like that's, like, a natural extension <laughs> <laughs> I of how much it. better you are than Darla. <laughs> <laughs> Darla. Um, yeah, I was just like, oh... That's so crazy that she would mess that up. Um, and I wanted to do it. I was like, that would have been so fun to be in this movie. And Orange County, you know, is like, to me, is like worlds apart from L.A. in a lot of ways. It's very different. There's some certain, like, cultural SoCal things that translate. But I feel like I identify with kids who grew up in, like, the Midwest or the South. You know, almost more than kids who grew up in L.A. Because... It is so conservative. It is so, like, it's this very, like, wholesome, everything's in a bubble. They call it, you know, living behind, like, the orange curtain. It's very different. Um, But having said that, it is close enough that I grew up knowing kids who sometimes would come up and go on auditions. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was a thing. I, like, knew what an agent was, and I was like, it was like I was asking it for, like, a Christmas gift. It was like, Mom, get me an agent. (laughs) Um, And she very wisely said no. Um, But she was like, hey, if you are really interested in what this actually is, which is acting, like, I'm not just, it's not just being famous. Like, if you want to act and learn what that's like, I'll find a place for you to do. And we already were, like, a very musical, like, all three of us took music lessons. Like, we were already, like, very artistic as a, I feel like my mom really made that a priority for the three of us. So it wasn't, like, a leap that we would do a play. So the dance studio that my sister and I were already at did little plays, And so the first show I did was when I was eight was Gulliver's Travels. And I played an additional Lilliputian soldier named Molly (laughs) Putt. I had eight lines. And uh, one time Gulliver forgot his line and I improvised a way to give him his cue because not only did I know my lines, I knew every word of the whole show because I was a crazy person. (laughs) But very helpful. Yeah. Well, one time I remember it must have been like a two weekend run. So like the day of our like second sh- like the Friday of the second weekend we did a a speed through of all the lines just to make sure you know over the week people hadn't forgotten and I was probably on the younger end you know it was probably like 8 to 12 year olds doing this show and someone was missing and out of nowhere I just like said all of her lines whoa and people were like what do you still do that like do you have everybody's lines usually memorized for things yeah and is that because you just have a very good memory yeah it like um i hate the twilight books but um i read them (laughs) and have memorized them (laughs) and have memorized them no but i there is like this theory in the twilight books which is that like (laughs) this is so stupid but like uh that when you become a vampire you get like an additional power but it's just a heightening of something you had in real life so like edward was perceptive and so as a vampire he can read minds you know which is like kind of one of the only things in the twilight universe that i was like that's pretty cool that, like, your superhuman version of yourself is really just a heightening of your human self. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. I can get on board with that. Um, I read all of those books in, like, three days because they were, like, a bee in my ear. I just wanted to be done with them. They were so terrible. But I read <laughs> one of them, and I was like, well, now I have to see how it ends. So I just, like, 
didn't do anything but read them, so it would just be over. <laughs> um, but I feel like if I became a vampire <laughs> or, a, or a superhero, memory would be like something about memory would become my superpower. Because that's kind of your natural superpower. It is my with. natural super, superpower, yeah. So then I started doing plays. I, never, like, I kept doing them at that dance studio. And then, and they would always be like these off brand, like cheap children's theater shows to buy the rights for. They were never like, you know, shows you would heard, have heard of really. We did like a version of Snow White where I was a dwarf named Gloomy Gus. And <laughs> like, we did like a Winnie the Pooh where I was Piglet. That was really fun. But I probably did like eight shows there. Um, and then at the same time, my, the middle school that I was going to go to, they did me a musical every year. And then when I was in fifth grade, they started doing this thing where they would let the fifth and sixth graders who were going to go to that middle school do the shows. So in fifth grade, they did Oliver and I got to be Oliver, which I think is still my mom's favorite performance of mine <laughs> in my whole life. And was it uh, <clears throat> objectively pretty good? You know, knowing what I know now, it wasn't, it wasn't authentic. But... Um, you know, I'm sure it was pretty good in that, like, I could kind of do a British accent, I could sing well, and I looked like a boy. So I think, like, already that's pretty impressive for, like, an 11-year-old and or a 10-year-old. And where's the missing authenticity? Well, I remember, like, we had to do... They ended up double-casting me and this other girl, um, Brittany Hammond. Shout out to Brittany Hammond. She's a great talent. Um, and we kind of, like... We were the only kids who, like, liked doing plays in our elementary school, and we kind of were just, like, always, you know, like, okay, great, yeah. Um... I would hesitate to say compete because we ended up splitting the role, but I guess sort of compete. But she was great. Um, and uh, we, I think for the callback when it was down to like me, her, and a couple other kids, we had to sing Where's Love. And I remember practicing it at home with my mom and sister, and I calculated where to take pauses to make it sound like I was crying. So in that sense, it wasn't authentic. But I like the artifice of it was successful enough that when I sang Where's Love in the show, like people cried because it was like convincing enough coming from such a young child. I guess it kind of just brings questions of what is authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Because like, is it is it that the audience is moved or is well, it that you're actually moved? Totally. I mean, in a perfect world, both. But like, I think I like, don't really believe that like I'm not uh Whoa. Drawing a line between you and Anne Hathaway. Because <laughs> you're way better than Anne Hathaway. Whoa! And, like, in Les Mis, I don't really believe that, like... She, I don't know how much, like, what she's doing is technical. Yeah. And she sings, like, I Dreamed a Dream. Well, I guess that's the point, is, like, t in the end, you're doing a job, and the, um, the job is to affect the audience, not yourself. And I think that, yes, yeah, so... The most authentic thing for me to do is to complete my job successfully, which I think I was doing even as like a little kid. But I think that it would have been, it would have maybe had more resonance if I'd been able to back it up at all with even starting to think about what it would actually be like to be an orphan. So, you know, like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, uh, this is something I remember like talking about in acting class, in acting school, which is just like, if the script says cry, you still have to cry. It doesn't matter if you're not feeling it that night. Obviously, like, in a perfect world, you would. Um, or you'd be able to at least bring some measure of yourself to that moment. Um, but, hey, the script says cry. You still have to cry. Do you think that's something that's grown about you as an actress? That, like, you, you'd now put more of actual feeling into things? Or do you feel like you're still... Kind of, how much are you still technical? And how much do you still... Or do you now feel? I hope that I feel a lot more. But I know... That was, like, my struggle going through acting class was that I was a very, like, I was always, I was coming a lot from my head. Like, I could do all the work. I could, like, know all the beats. I could tell you what my objective was. I could answer all the ten questions. I would know exactly, like, what was happening. I would have dissected the scene and studied it and tried hard and known all my lines, obviously. Um, but that that wasn't the same. And I think maybe just across the board, I'm, like, it's been a process for me to become a more emotionally accessible person. Um, and I think I had, I remember um, doing like a Shakespeare scene, my uh, junior year, junior year. Um, uh, what is the play now? Measure for Measure, I think, where the brother, she's she wants to be a nun and it's like, is she gonna sleep with the man to release her brother? Does this sound... Do you know this at all? No. 
I might be completely wrong. Anyway, we had to do this scene, and my scene partner did not know his lines, which, like, really sucks, especially for Shakespeare, because, like, what can you really do? Yeah. Um, you can I, feed them their whole <laughs> lines and improvise away. Exactly. Like, like, uh, but I, um, I remember that when that scene was over, he was like, yeah, that was, like, a real breakthrough for you. Um, and maybe that was easier for me, like... I think I've been a little bit of a late bloomer in some ways, but maybe, like, the sibling relationship was a lot easier to identify with, like, than maybe, like, a romantic love situation where it was, like, I know what it would be like to want to, like, to do anything to save my brother's life. I can, like, think about that. Um, And, uh, but, yeah, I would say that that is probably still a thing. And now it's kind of gone untested for a few years because I haven't done a lot of dramatic work. Where do you think that emotional... You said you want to become more emotionally accessible as a person. Yeah. Where do you think that block comes from? I just, like... I think it is from being a good student. Like, from, like, thinking that there's a right way to do something to, like, caring about getting the correct answers. Um, And maybe just a general immaturity, really. Like... I remember it was a really long time before I cried in a movie, you know, like, um, letting other things like affect me and that my emotions would be more like frustration or temper rather than like, I don't remember feeling big feelings of like hurt or ennui or like being overwhelmed by the majesty of the world until like later in life, until like college where I feel like some of that started to really like unlock, um, And now I feel like I'm kind of, I definitely feel like I'm a more emotional person now than I was at 18. Big, like, big time. Whether or not I would be able to channel that into, like, a role, um, you know. Obviously, I don't think comedy and tragedy are so different. There's still, like, real human stuff happening. That's an interesting way to grow. I think not the usual. (laughs) Because I think usually people, like, numb over time. So becoming more vulnerable over time is a cool thing. Or uh, in tune with your emotions. Yeah, definitely. I think that's definitely the case. I mean, maybe other parts of me become numb. um, But uh, I think that, like, my excitement over, I guess, maybe recognizing it as a good thing to feel things in a big way, as opposed to viewing it as maybe weakness. And how much, as you acted in middle school and then in high school, did you keep in mind, like, that end goal of, like, I want to be in the movies? Um, hmm. A lot, I guess. I mean, but also I was like, uh, in my eighth grade yearbook, it says like that I want to be a singer and actor and the president. A singer and actor in your what yearbook? Eighth grade. Okay. Um, and then in high school still, like I was, you know, very into like, I love, I took a lot of AP classes. I was like a very serious student. I, um, I think in, um, my, my brother was like, um, a really good student and my uh, sister was like a big star in choir and theater. So in either realm that I did anything in, they had already like done it really well. And you were being compared to them and people would be like, oh, you're there. Yeah. My first day of freshman year in my English class, my teacher was like, oh, you Tim McKenna's little sister. My, he's a brilliant boy. (laughs) <laughs> it was like, cool. <laughs> um, and then, like, same thing. It was like, my sister had just left, so students also remember, you know, like, you know, three months earlier, she was, like, doing a solo in the choir show, you know? So, like, that was, like, even more present. And that was something I was more passionate about. Like, uh, I knew I would, like, try hard in class, but I was like, well, I'm excited to, like, I want to make vocal ensemble as a, you know, end of my freshman year, which is the earliest you can make it, which is, like, the audition choir, just like Cat. You know, if I don't make it the same time my sister did, then I'll know for sure that I'm not as good. Um, but I did make it, so. <laughs> Where is it? So, no, she's a better singer than me. But I was good enough that I was, like, uh, one of the, like, the stronger singers in my class. And then and then I think, like, I was doing more theater than she had done. Like, I, you know, ended up being, like, thespian president. I was in comedy sports, so I started doing short form when I was 14. And was, like, in my junior year, I was, like, the captain of comedy sports. So I did more of that. And I was like more obsessed with leadership. Like I was also president of choir. So, uh, I was more like into (laughs) 
accumulating titles. But um, the other thing that I found that I loved was Mock Trial, which I was just, like, obsessed with. And what was cool about Mock Trial was that neither of them had done it. Um, so it was, like, my own thing. Like, no one... My when my parents came, or when like my family came to watch me do a trial, like they had no frame of reference for what I was doing, and I just got obsessed with it. I loved it so much. So in high school, there was a little bit of push and pull of like, will I go to law school or will I like stick with acting? And I remember we were doing like at the end of all of our plays, we would do a closure circle and like <clears throat> I don't know memories about the play, and like you would talk, you would give the show shirt to like the kid who you know, did something special for the show or whatever. Or, or, I don't remember. It was like thank you gifts to the director. It was just like a little close or whatever. And I remember saying at the end of the last play that I did my senior year, which was Midsummer, I was like, a part of me wonders if this is the last play I'll ever do. Wow. Um, and I'm if it is, I'm really, like, thankful. I, like, had a great experience. So I went into Northwestern undecided. Not knowing if you were going to be, the, like, a Supreme Court justice. Like, Kind of literally, yeah. Like, I, um, uh, but that lasted, like, for, like, three weeks. So. <laughs> any, any feeling, like, alongside I might be a lawyer, I might be an actor, of, like, I might be the next American Idol? No. Because you knew, like, you're not as good of a singer as your sister, and so that counts you out? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, like, you know how, like, some athletes, like, they play football, and then they, like, do track in the off season. I think I just always felt like that's what singing was for me. Mm-hmm. Was like I and I felt like my sister was the reverse. Like she also did the show. Like she also did plays. But she was she went to school as like a vocal music major. I eventually became a theater major. Like I always cared more about the acting side. I like singing. Um and I yeah, I love music. I love singing. I don't but I was never like uh, I never thought I was gonna be a singer. What about Broadway kind of aspirations? Yeah, I guess I had those, but those also died really quickly because. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, they came back for like a short period. I was, still, I mean, they're still now they're like sort of there in the back of my head, but like. Yeah, you can a, get to them in this, in this like, like weird way where I become a TV star and then I get to be on a Broadway show. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like that's, I saw Paige Davis from Trading Spaces <laughs> in Chicago. That was. Ooh. <laughs> I feel like I remember hearing the story that her and her husband met doing like. Anyway. She was terrible. Oh man, that's awful. But if Paige Davis can do it, like yeah. if you're like the star of a show, you yeah. can certainly more than do it. Oh my god, I certainly think about that. Like that's um, a real daydream of mine. Is that like now the only way for me to like be on Broadway is for me to become a huge television star, <laughs> and then in like hiatus, be like, I'd like to do this musical, and I would absolutely love to do that. I love musicals, but. Um, because I wasn't a theater major for the first, like, three weeks of freshman year at Northwestern, I missed the opportunity to audition for the musical theater program. Um, and I had to, like, come in this back way. I had to transfer schools because I was, like, in the College of Arts and Sciences. I had to transfer into School of Communication. And though Northwestern doesn't have auditions, they do have a cap. So I had to wait till kids dropped till I got in, which they told me could take, like, forever, but it ended up... I got in, like, winter quarter. That's good. Yeah. So I was never... I ended up not falling behind, especially because you don't take acting class until sophomore year. So then I was in an acting... Like, it played out exactly the same, except for not auditioning for musical theater. And then you can audition as a sophomore, but they take only, like, two people. And most of the people that they take have... Though they didn't make it their freshman year, they were in a voice studio, which I wasn't. Um, this is like blaming it on politics, which it could have just been that I wasn't good enough, but I didn't make it my sophomore year when I auditioned. So then that was like, oh, I won't do musicals. So what changed three weeks into Northwestern yeah. that made you go, I'm going to go for this? All my friends that I started making were theater majors. Um, uh, and I like went and was, I auditioned for both improv groups. Um, there was, there's a long form group at, Northwestern called the Titanic Players that casts a brand new team every year, which is awesome because then by your senior year, you've been with those people all four years. Um, I think Jen already talked about this. Uh, and We can't get enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> Titanic Players. Um, and then there's another group called Meow that is like a 30, I mean, at this point, I guess like 40 year tradition that is just eight people and it's short form and sketch. And that's, like, they only put in as people graduate. So it's, like, a little harder to make, I guess. And it attracts 
um, more of like a whole campus audience and they would only do like two really big shows in the winter that had like a live rock band and it would be kind of like an event. So it was a little like rock star status to be in Meow. And when did you get in there? I got, I was on Meow my junior year. Um, so I got a call back my friend, like they would always give like a few cursory callbacks to freshmen as just like, good job kids. So I got one of those, which was like huge. And at the callback, I met like one of my now best friends. Um, and so I, you want to say their name? Connor White, baby. <laughs> um, is that uh, Shane Ziegler's f- uh-huh. friend? Yeah. Okay. And Annabeth's boyfriend. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, so we met in improv callbacks and have been like best friends ever since. And I found out that I made my Titanic player scene, which Connor also made. I didn't make meow, which was like no big surprise. And then I wanted to coach another, like the, the Titanic teams were coached by other students and I wanted to coach. So they wouldn't let Connor and I audition for meow our sophomore year. So then I couldn't audition again until my junior year. Um, so you could have potentially gotten in. We'll never know. We'll (laughs) never know. Uh, it all worked out. But, um, so I made long form, I made that team and that was like super exciting. All my friends were theater majors and I just was like, experience isn't the same as training. Like, I kind of thought, even if I want to pursue acting, I don't need to be a theater major. And then I was like, I, I want that. Like, I want someone to, like, tell me how to do it. Um, and I don't want to think, like, I'm too good or, like, I don't need that. Like, I want to study this like it's a real craft. And not to say that, like, Northwestern isn't totally the school to do that because it's not a conservatory. But for my personality, it was a good hybrid because it was, like, the actual acting class felt pretty serious and you're with the same 25 kids for all three years, the same teacher. So it is a really like small studio feel. Um, and I worked really hard at that, but then the rest of it was like, it's not like I was in a ton of like conservatory type classes. Um, and then I also did do mock trial and I hated it. It was like, what turned the coaches. I think like the coaches in high school, I'm still close with. They were like, mentors to me the people who did mock trial were like this amazing venn diagram of like smart kids who weren't who were also like articulate and good at like improvising and like it i loved the other kids on the team um i felt like it was like it just like threw into focus that what i liked about it was being on a team making stuff up (laughs) (laughs) and i liked using my brain like i liked that it was intellectually challenging but that, like, when I had gotten to college and in competition, you'd had to, like, really know the levels of a relevance objection. You couldn't just object relevance. I was like, now I'm kind of done. Like, this has gotten to a point where it's not, it's getting too technical. Like, <laughs> and the coaches weren't as nurturing. And I had to be in, like, Des Moines doing tournaments when, like, Kanye West played at Northwestern. And I was like, this is, I don't, this isn't, I don't want this. So even if you had gotten to be a Supreme Court justice, you'd have still been, like, really craving to do Harold. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah. So, uh, so it was like, yeah, it was like, oh, mock trial, I liked it in high school for kind of, like, different reasons. And um, I don't need to be a lawyer. I'm going to, so I transferred in, and then that was that. Was that. When I've heard you talking about college in the past, it sounds like you had, like, a really pristine experience. (laughs) What are some, like, can you give some snapshots that show, like, how fun college was to you? I loved it. You know, I think, like, part of it was in high school I was a very, like, floater of a kid. Like, I had a lot of different, like, separate groups of friends. And in college, I feel like I found, like, a tribe. And I felt like our grade in particular was, like, super close. I was also close with, like, kids not in my grade, but... I'd say that was like the huge, a huge part of it. It was, um, we had like this really vibrant student theater. Like, I don't know how much I actually loved Northwestern in terms of like what professors there gave me. I loved my acting class and I loved like a handful of other classes, but I had a lot of problems with how the theater department was run. In reaction to that, because they attract such like talented driven kids, student theater was insane. There was like 60 shows a year put on entirely by students. So that became my world and my life was like, you know, I remember my roommate was producing this play and I was the assistant set designer and my, one of my close friends was the set designer. We were up till like two in the morning painting these flats in this like tiny, what used to be a bunker. And like, we were blaring Tracy Chapman. Like we ran out in the snow to wake back up. Like, and, uh, doing meow was like 
feeling like a rock star. Like I remember like walking out on stage and being like, well, I'm chasing this feeling of like, there is a live audience that is like losing their mind for these like stupid sketches we wrote. And we've tried so hard. We rehearsed every day for five hours for this like sketch and improv show. Uh, like I threw this party for only the senior theater majors with my, some of my friends called the risky business party where everyone had to come dress as like Tom Cruise's risky business. We invited <laughs> every kid who was a theater major. So it was like, you know, kids that I knew for all four years, but wasn't like, f- weren't friends with, but it was like, the hundred of us are going to freaking rage together right now. <laughs> like, that was really incredible. Um, uh, like, being in company my sophomore year as I was, like, saying goodbye to musicals, but that was really exciting. Um, you know, we all lived in these same apartments. Like, I, you could just, like, walk up these old back alleys of this, like, old apartment building, and you knew kids in every apartment. And it was just, like, living in... I don't know, like, it was, it was the best. Utopia. Yeah, it was utopia. Like, I had such a good time. And Jen D'Angelo was a part of your life? And- mm-hmm. Jen is a year younger than me, so she made the Titanic team that was made for her year, and then she made Meow my senior year. Um, so we had one year on Meow together. And we also were in this group together that um, w- part of doing student theater at Northwestern was, like, these mini theater companies. And... Um, we were on this one together that put up student written plays. So like we produced her play. Um, and yeah, you know, we, uh, we go, we go way back (laughs) almost 10 years. So was there any thought of going anywhere but LA after college? I went to New York first. Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Which that was like for a year for a year. Yeah. What was that year? Like weird, fun, (laughs) But weird. Like, I took the first two levels of UCB. I made Story Pirates. I worked at a bakery. I was sad and confused. But I lived with, like, three of my best friends. In and, Brooklyn? Uh, no, 109 in Amsterdam, like, Morningside Heights. And a lot of my best friends moved to New York. So I think that was part of it. I was very, like, New York, L.A., New York, L.A. And then most of my friends were moving to New York, so I went to New York. And it was also, like driven by a desire to still do theater, you know, like I remember my acting teacher telling me, you know, I see that you are, you know, you do a lot of comedy. I also like, don't want you to give up on doing Chekhov. And I just like really took that to heart. And now I'm kind of over that. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like there was a little bit of like a veil of pretension of like Northwestern didn't talk about LA. It was like, when you stay in Chicago or go to New York, Like, they were training you to be, like, a theater artist. There weren't any on-camera classes. Like, it wasn't a part of what we talked about. So I didn't... I thought it was... You know, I I was pretentious. I was like, that's shallow. Yeah. And now I'm like, everything I love and want is television. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, it just was like... I had to, like, grow out of that a little bit. And... Goldberg's over Chekhov. Yeah. All day, day. every day. (laughs) I mean, honestly, I would love to do Chekhov. I really like the the Northwestern curriculum is you your junior year you kind of like grow with the evolution of subtlety so of I mean of subtext so you start with the Greeks which have no subtext which everyone just like exactly says exactly what they're thinking they're basically like arguing like lawyers all the time and then we move to Shakespeare which has like a little bit of subtext where like sometimes people are like saying one thing and meaning another there's like you know, soliloquy, and there's, like, a little bit of variation, and then Chekhov is, like, all subtext, where you're talking about the weather, but you're actually talking about, are you going to spend your lives together? You talk about the weather, he leaves the room, she collapses and cries. And I loved that quarter. That Chekhov quarter was, like, mwah. <laughs> I loved it so much. So, I mean, that was, like, a real thing for me, I guess, but I just didn't see it. Like, I, after less than a year there, I was, like, how does that even happen? What are the roles? Meanwhile, like, No one's ever really told me I'm good at that. People have told me I'm good at improv and being funny. Yeah. And a lot of times people told me in in Northwestern that my acting style was too small for theater. Like, meaning, like, probably better for camera. Yeah. (laughs) Um, That's a good note to get. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, I didn't know how to... You know, I was small in my body. Like, I prefer... Like, it wouldn't... I'm not super good in my body like it wouldn't um I feel like my performances wouldn't like radiate out from my fingertips it would like be in my face which Mm -hmm. is fine if you're on camera um 
So it was like kind of, uh, I actually specifically, it was this, um, I would check like plate. I had no representation. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I worked in a bakery and then I worked in a restaurant and I did a little bit of story pirates and took one and two of UCB and I, with who, um, John Cabris and then Brandon Gardner. Cool. Um, I, uh, was, oh, well, one day there was, um, a posting that they were having auditions in New York for the Lieutenant of Anishmore, but for out here for the Mark Taper. And I love Martin McDonough. And I love that play. And there's like a young girl part. And I was like, I need to audition for this. But I had no way of doing it. Like they, I didn't have like, the only call they had was for a union. I had like, I was not in the union. I was like trying to call in favors of people I knew in Los Angeles to see if I could get an audition. And I never did. But the process of me like daydreaming about auditioning for that led me to be like, Maybe I'll, I'll go to L.A. for three months to do this play. I'll be back by my family, which will be so fun. I'll be there for the summer. How great. Maybe an agent will see me. Then I'll get repped, and then I'll stay in L.A. And then it was like that seed just sort of like burrowed and grew where it was like, or I should just move to L.A. Like, <laughs> yeah. And if I want to move to L.A., I should go now because there's nothing keeping me here except for my friends. But I, you know, they, they can't be why I make decisions, especially at 23. So... I just decided to move to L.A. Um, and then it, a couple people ended up also moving to L.A., which was great. Um, made that transition easier. It was hard. Like, some of my best friends still live in New York. Like, that makes me... It was hard, but it was like, you got to do you. And, and then it was kind of like a no-brainer. You know, it was like, obviously, I'm back by my family. I'm probably way better suited for comedy and TV. I'm going to, like, really pursue that and not feel guilty about it and not feel like I'm selling out, like... It's what I want. I want to be on a TV show. Um, or I want to help make TV. I want to be in TV. Um, and then weirdly, I moved to I moved to LA. And then Jen was a year younger than me, so she was going to be my roommate. But she was kind of like in between what her summer was going to be. So I had just sort of like randomly decided a day to move. So I just like lived at home with my mom for the summer, which was a little weird. Which is like made me feel <laughs> like a real slacker. But it was fine because it was just like a couple months. And it was, it was kind of just like, well, what am I going to do? I'm, wa- I'm waiting for Jen. And I came up to audition into the Groundlings School and went to a party afterwards of, like, Northwestern people who were in between. I had been back in California for, like, a month and a half, not up in L.A. at all. This was, like, one of my first days up in L.A. And that at that party, I met Morgan. And our first date was seeing the lieutenant of Anishmore. Whoa. And he was a Northwestern person, too, who you had not known? Yeah. He was a senior and I was a freshman. So we had mutual friends of, like, the grades in between, but I didn't know him at school. Very cool. Yeah. It was, I was like, you're taking me to the play, which is the reason I'm here. So, and you had not even talked about it? No. It just happened naturally? So that's pretty mystic. Yeah, right? I've always been like, whoa, so crazy. Like, I wouldn't even live in this city if it wasn't for this play. Or I would, but maybe it, maybe it would have been a year later. Maybe, you know, like, who knows what that would have... That, I, I credit that play with being the catalyst. Yeah, that's... So, like, you were just going out on this date, and then the surprise was, like, I bought these two tickets to this thing? Well, it wasn't a surprise. He had said, like, would you go on a date with me? And then he was like, how about we go here? That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah, it was really cool. And then the girl who ended up being that part is also a Northwestern person who's an amazing actress, and she was great. (laughs) A lot of things coming together. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you describe what your path has kind of been out in L.A.? Sure. Wandering. <laughs> no, um, well, Has it been? I don't it, know. Maybe not. I it guess feels pretty... Direct? Yeah. Cool. At least as I know it, but uh, I also had forgotten you were in New York. Yeah. Ever. Um, I just was like thinking in preparation of this that at that time we went to Intelligentsia and had such like a great, like long conversation. Yeah, I really liked that. That was great. It's like, oh, this will be easy. It'll be just like that time we were at Intelligentsia and wondering if we should tell Jason Minzu because we knew who he was. <laughs> And I talked slightly too loud. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Oh, we like totally geeked out about Carolina Change. Yeah, yeah I, I could do it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Do you want me to just do it for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let my sorrow make evil love me. <laughs> um, so you moved to LA and did you jump right into... Oh, so you did your Groundlings audition and what happened there? Yeah, so I made it into like the school, which I, you know... Um, 
And I knew I wanted to do both, and I had heard that the ground... Both Groundlings and UCB. That's right, yeah. And I'd heard that the Groundlings weights were really long, so I was like, let me knock out those first two Groundlings before I go back to UCB. So I did that. I, like, did one and two of Groundlings, um, and then started the weightless process, and then did three and four. Um, And so that would have been... Moved in 2010, so that was early 2011, like, Mar- no, I think I took 301 in, like, March 2011. So I took, um, and by this point, the only thing I'm really doing, I'm already doing Story Pirates, because it started, it started its LA branch right when I moved, which ended up being amazing, because just by have, having done it, like, six months longer than the people they cast out here, I ended up becoming, like, a veteran way faster, which was awesome for my... I, first of all, I love Story Pirates more than most things on this planet, but also because it really gave me, like, a foothold. I was performing all the time. I was on, like, their main stage. I was teaching a lot, so that became, like, a really important um, job, uh, like, source of income was doing teaching with Story Pirates. So that was amazing timing because that's sort of a ladder. It's not, like, a long ladder, but it would have taken me maybe another year or so in New York to have reached the level that I was able to sort of jump to, um, where I was like directing and doing like a ton. So that was really cool. Um, so then I take UCB and those are both great. I feel like maybe I couldn't get into a 401 until really late in the, or maybe I took it in. I went on this tour for Story Pirates where I was gone from L.A. for a month or a little over a month. Um, and I remember that kind of messing with my ability to audition for Harold. What I think it was like I knew Harold was going to happen. Yeah, I think that's what it was. So then I had to cram in my 401 when I got back from this tour so that I could be eligible. Um, yeah, that's what it was. So uh, I was gone for a month doing this tour, which was really fun. Uh, and then I came back and like, was in the middle of my 401 when Harold auditions happened. Yeah. And made it that did, time? Did not make it. Okay. Um, Were you also at this time already on, like, was it Murder Cliff was your yeah. improv team? Uh-huh. Yeah, I had joined Murder Cliff maybe, like, February of that year through Dan Foster, who's a Northwestern friend. They had been a practice group from a 401, lost some members, wanted to, were still practicing regularly, wanted to beef their numbers so they had me join and at that point it was uh darian um darian clark chris Tourages, john schmidt me dan foster and zach reno and we rehearsed every sunday with will mclaughlin and um that was awesome that was like i feel like a month later we won tnt or like march madness or something so that was my first toe in the indie community and i really haven't had a ton other like yeah that's my only real practice group i've ever really been a part of was murder cliff were you doing musical improv at the same time no that happened a little later where we were like we would always freestyle rap to warm up and then eventually you're we like let's start playing with this in a form but we probably rehearsed i practiced with them they'd already been doing it for like a year i joined probably like another six months before we added rap um and then mike still sort of coached us for a little bit helping us put figure out what that form was and yeah murder cliff i love murder cliff um so I didn't make Harold my first time, but I, uh, but Neil Campbell, I got a call back and Neil Campbell wrote me an email afterwards being like, Hey, close but no cigar. No, no. A very kind email that meant obviously the world to me. Yeah. That's really nice encouragement. Definitely. And I really was not connected to the scene. I had like, was in the middle of my second class in LA. Like nobody knew who I was. Um, so then he offered me an internship so that I could like get more, so that more people would know me, basically. And I really, because of Story Pirates, I was never, like, an intern. I, like, filled in. I was only a fill-in. I, like, worked up enough to take one class, which was Musical Improv with Madeline. Um, oh, that's really fun. Yeah. I mean, she didn't teach it, but we took it together, and that's where I first met her. <laughs> right. Um, it was with Eliza Skinner. It was with Eliza Skinner. Um, uh, and then a month later, I made Mod. So then awesome. I was on New Money for a year, and then that fall, I made Harold. Made Mr. Town City. I'll have them very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I had one one no. So I'm super lucky. Very lucky. Yeah. Um, before uh, being on both New Money and your Herald team, any like 
success that happened out here, like other than making it onto like theater company kind of things? No, I don't think so. I don't think anything really happened except for, you know, I felt good about what I was doing with Story Pirates. Um, so were you feeling at all frustrated or like nervous about like, are, are things going to happen at that time? Or did you feel like pretty uh, optimistic? I think very optimistic. I think that I knew getting on teams at UCB was an important step. Um, and so I think I was focused on accomplishing that before I worried about like, I don't have an agent, you know, like, um, I just wouldn't, I didn't know how you would get one besides having a venue where people could see you. Um, and I knew that like my world was going to be the like comedy world. So I knew that it was important that like, I don't remember being super worried at that stage. Cause I think it was just like, get this done. This is like step one. And then we can kind of like worry about where to go from there. Yeah, I feel like, and it was already so much better than New York where it was like really no encouragement that it was like, okay, cool. Um, And I was doing, I had made it a priority to not take a restaurant job because I knew that that would like keep me from having my nights free. Um, so I had to like cobble a bunch of weird jobs. Most of in the early stages, I like ended up being an office manager at an SAT company. But then I was starting to get to a place where I could cobble together, like just a little bit of tutoring or doing presentations at schools for the theater camp I went to and worked at, plus singing at preschools, plus teaching for story pirates. So I was also you got ha- paid to sing at preschools. Uh huh. What was that through? <laughs> <laughs> My friend, Danny Teeger, <laughs> who was a story pirate friend. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was fun. Uh, yeah, I did that until just like last summer, I guess that was when it ended. So I was also like happy that I was getting closer to putting money together that was at least in the realm of what I wanted to do, be doing. So I don't remember being like antsy yet. Yeah. You know, maybe I was. I'm sure there's, everybody's a little afraid all the time. In moments, so it doesn't sound like that was the, your big thing. No, 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 no. My LA time has been pretty positive. I think my most fearful year so far has been that New York year. That's great. So what was it like then being on Mr. Town City and New Money? Just the best. Just like so exciting. And that felt like, um, I feel like maybe this is happening less and less, but when I made New Money, Mod still felt like less of a big deal to make than Harold. And it felt like the sketch and improv worlds were a little separate. So even though I was like, I'm officially a performer here, I'm performing, you know, people are seeing me here. I didn't totally feel integrated into the theater until I felt like I was on both worlds. Maybe because both worlds matter to me. If I only cared about sketch, I don't think it would matter to me that like people on Harold Knight didn't know who I was. But because I love improv, like, more than more than sketch, I would say, um, it was, like, once I made both, I felt like, oh, cool. I'm, like, really a part of this theater now. Which is also, I think, fake and BS. Because you should be a part of the theater when you are, like, giving it any amount of your attention. You know, like... I think that's true. All it takes is for you to care about adding to what that world is. For you to consider yourself a part of UCB. Yeah, I was not on any teams. I was just like an intern and putting in a lot of time and putting up Spanx there. Yeah. And like, I when people said like, what are you doing out in LA? I would say I'm doing a lot of stuff with this theater UCB. Yeah. And then the problem was just like, it gets hard to like, when they say, what does that mean? Yeah. Like, are you on a team there? Like, you don't have a good answer after that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that that like, it's, and it's, we're part of this like time where it's like really growing. Which is exciting. You know, it's a little like, oh, are we losing, is it losing some sort of like underground cool kid edge? But also I feel like, who cares? Yeah. I mean, maybe care, but also like, there's, uh, I like that I feel like it's becoming more inclusive or that there are more than one way to be a part of that theater because obviously not everyone is good at doing a Herald but you could still be a really funny person who has something to add to this community, this, this like voice that I feel like is getting really distilled and is really out there. There's like people who are a generation ahead of us or two ahead of us who have like paved the way for us to really like be a part of, um, 
like a shared vocabulary that I think is really cool. So I think that was in my head. Or maybe it wasn't. I think it shouldn't have been the case that I wasn't legitimate at that theater until I was on two teams. But uh, I maybe felt that way a little bit. And then so I felt like I could breathe a little after I made both. And how did you grow on both of those teams and get better at both those things? Um, I think I've definitely gotten better at... I feel like Pneumonia has made me bolder um, in terms of choices. And then... Gosh, I don't know. It's kind of hard because I feel like you could grow as an improviser and you could still not be great at the Herald. <laughs> like, it's hard. He's- and, like, I might be... I might be working, like, not to the atrophy of others, but you have to work very specific muscles to do the Herald that then you might not ever really use. If you, like, stop doing a Herald and are on, like, a montage team, there's going to be things about your brain that you've had to really focus and refine about, like, second beats that you might, like, never, ever do again, which is a shame because I think that's a good skill. Um, And ultimately, I think that might help you in a writing capacity more than anything else. But I do feel like, you know, um, doing a Herald is like only writing sonnets. It's very structured. And, you know, sometimes structure allows for greater creativity because I think like rules can be helpful. But it is sort of a little hard for me to see like what skills will remain when I'm doing other kinds of improv or like what's really obviously game, getting better at gameplay. That's a huge growth. Um everyone on Mr. Town City that was their first team which is a different experience than coming into a team that has like uh, a mix of returning new whatever which is how I f- which is how my team dunk tank is now and I definitely feel like a pretty aggressive leader on dunk tank not necessarily like personal dynamic wise but like I'm making big aggressive moves like all the time like whoosh we are here now this is I'm like this is a I'm doing a crazy third beat transition because that's what's exciting for me about using that form. Um, and maybe on Mr. Town City, we were all a little more like, what? who do we, what are we, are we doing this? How bold are we? Are we this bold? What kind of team are we? How's it <laughs> happening? And yeah. both have been great. You know, I both were like extremely valuable experiences and there's nothing that can replace just hours, just reps, just practice both in just for Harold and for improv in general. So I don't know how specifically I've grown, but like, you know, what does it take? It's 10,000 hours or something to become a master. It's just like, I'm getting hours, man. <laughs> yeah. Hours and hours and hours. What came first? You getting your first like professional booking or getting an agent? Um, getting an agent. And what, how did that happen? Well, I was, you know, gift best. Gift basketed rain, as all UCB performers are. Right, right. Was- Here, here's your welcome basket. <laughs> you now are with rain. Um, that was that was great. I have not had like a ton of success commercially. I don't feel like I've ever like gone out a ton. Um, I got like one web commercial that I actually got through Story Pirates, not through Rain. I love that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Zeusk. Is that what I, you're talking about? Yeah, it blew yeah. my mind just because I I like, kept seeing it on YouTube and I didn't know it was you. Like, I just thought it was, and then figuring out that it was you. Like, I heard you talking about it at a new money. Yeah. I was like, wait, that commercial I keep seeing? Yeah. Because you look kind of different there. Yeah, I do, yeah. And also, talking that little heart. Talking that you know? little heart, yeah. Well, that's so crazy. It's like, that thing had, like, um, over millions and millions of views, and that's, like, the bummer about a web new not yeah. union thing. It's like, that's so you must have made millions and millions of dollars. Oh, certainly not, you know? <laughs> just the money for that one day of work. But it was a very, that was very fun. Um, but I didn't get that through a traditional auditioning. Um... And then I had one manager that actually I guess I got before I made teams through this weird way of I went to an acting coach and he helped me make a reel and then he passed it around. And then I had one manager and they were great, but eventually I felt like they weren't the right fit anymore. So November of 2013, I fired them, which was very hard. Because they were very nice people. And weren't bad. Like, weren't by any means bad. I had no credits, and they gave me, like, two great pilot seasons. But then it would kind of, like, I felt like I would lose focus in their brain. So right at that time, I got I got seen by another manager, who I'm still with, and they've been awesome. And then, uh, and then I booked this show, Riot. And then before it came... Towards the beginning of 2014? Yep. 20, um, like February 2014. Which I feel like 
when we had that like uh, like coffee uh-huh. and I had just done like the movie with Steve Carell yeah you did you know Riot was happening yet and that you were going to be working with him too I don't remember because I just remember like it having like a weird moment where I feel like you said like that was like the person you would want to like yeah. work with and and then I and then you obviously worked with him um, so <laughs> it felt like you secreted him. it to me but maybe you maybe already knew you were going to I don't remember oh, I'll have to look look, 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 through, look through my calendar and see when Coffee with Ben was um, so you got so you got how did you get Riot? manager got me an audition um, Riot was a like game show short form kind of show uh huh exactly it was a kind of show yeah um, will you describe it? <laughs> I would describe it like that it was like a they, it's a French format. The French didn't like it being described as this, but it was like Whose Line Meets Wipeout. And we filmed eight episodes in a week and a half. Um, we had celebrity guests. It was a very awesome experience, but not at all surprising to me that it wasn't a success. Um, and I attribute most of that. Even with that, like, uh, alphabet game? Oh, my gosh. There were so many ridiculous things. But, like, obviously it was, like, huge. It was my first series regular. I got to meet Steve Carell, which was, like, a dream come true. Uh, there were lots of really good things that came out of it, but it was also like, oh, <laughs> this isn't going to work. And I think a huge part of that is how fast we made it. There just was no time to be like, hey, is this bit working? Let's like figure out how this bit could work. It was like, sorry, we filmed two episodes in a day. Like, we filmed on a Wednesday, a Friday, and then the next week we filmed two a days on w- Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then it was done. So it was not surprising to me that it ended up being like a bit of a jumble. Um, and I'm ultimately like happy that it... That you know, because I had to sign like a regular series, regular contract, so I don't need to do that show for seven years. But doing it one time to like make some money and get some a little bit of like traction was great. Um, and then after that, I got an agent. Do you have the feeling that if you had gotten to take on like a creative consulting producer role on that show and have like a lot of power, like you could have fixed it? Sort of, I did do, I was just like completely outspoken. I'd be like. I think this game would play better if they if blah 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 blah, but because we had writers, so I would tell that to them. I wouldn't tell it to like people who like were signing my checks. Yeah. But um, no, I think I'll, I think ultimately we haven't totally cracked how to do improv on TV, and I think like adding a bunch of weird props and like stuff like that is not the solution. Okay. So I don't know if I could have ever really made that work for an American audience. I feel like we're just not. I Par- mean, parenthetically, I do think that the thing that was like didn't work about the show is just that that room wasn't slanted enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you do it at like a, like an 80 degree oh angle, my God. it could have really... You something. should just know how hard it is to even stand on that angle. It is insane. It is so crazy. Yeah, it I, just was I like, would love to be on that thing. It was fun. It was fun. Dangerous at all? Yes. Definitely. You got a little hurt? Just like, yeah, some bruises and stuff. Um, so you got your agent at Innovative, 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 yeah. Um, and that's like, and then, then yeah, I've just been like auditioning. I mean, Riot, Riot is still the, the biggest thing I've ever booked. But you've booked, so you also booked a pilot for voiceover. Yeah. I've actually now, uh, now I've done three voiceover pilots. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the one that was for Fox, like, I'm, you know... I don't think it's going to go at Fox. They're still, like, maybe going to try to take it other places. And then the other two I booked in the last, like, three months, maybe. And they're both um, for Disney. Congratulations. I really hope one of them... Me too. <laughs> ...works out. Yeah, that would be great. Um, the one, like... My ratings would go way up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all, all those kids who watch those Disney shows. Yeah, no, I mean, that would be amazing. Voiceover has been, like, a very fun surprise. Well, and what's been the surprise of it? And that I've had any the- success at all. <laughs> you know, that's like, that's a real throwing a drop into an ocean. Like, I have been with my voiceover agent for, I don't know, three years. I probably have submitted 400 auditions. I've had six callbacks. You know, I mean, the numbers are staggering. But it is so much less draining mentally, emotionally, and spiritually because... You just aren't facing that rejection in the same way. You're not going into rooms in front of people until it's to test. So it just is so much easier. And of smaller roles you've done on TV shows, like what have been 
the most fun to you? <clears throat> um, I well, through nepotism, I had like two lines on the Goldbergs. Um, because Morgan works on that show. Worked on the show at the time. Worked yeah. on it as a writer's assistant. That's right. Yeah. Um. So that was like thanks, thanks, babe. Um. And uh, um, I got my first TV thing ever was Comedy Bang Bang in early 2013 I want to say and that was through Neil so like you know that's just through the theater just offering me that part where I got to be like a couple with Renee Goubet uh that was really great um then like a month later I I did like a couple lines on the Jesselnick offensive also just straight through UCB so I mean like UCB is I can't credit them enough for just like everything that I have really (laughs) yeah uh and then um, Goldberg's was like, I mean, this is all through knowing people. I have, besides Riot and voiceover stuff, I haven't done anything on television through auditioning. That's pretty crazy. You know, I just did another comedy bang bang, um, which was a and, blast. And speaks well to like how this place works. Yeah. I mean, I think like that's when LA. You, yeah. <laughs> when you asked like, were you nervous? I think I already knew that UCB was gonna be my... I hate to say golden ticket because I feel like a lot of people put too many eggs in that basket, but certainly... Right, you're not not your golden ticket, but, like, your guarantee. The (laughs) thing that makes you... (laughs) The uh, thing that will 100% eventually make me a TV star is UCB. Well, but, I mean, it's not not true, you know, like... But I don't think... Unfortunately, it's not true for everyone. It's not like everyone on the performer page is going to be on TV, but I do think if I am on TV, it will be because of UCB. Yeah. You know, um... That's, that's, that's like a nice little quote for the website. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of these people will be famous, but if they are, it'll be because of us. And like, obviously your own talent and hard work and dedication is the other half of the equation, but being able to be seen, like, especially for comedy and also just like, it keeps me sane. Like, what do people do who are just auditioning for who their only world is auditioning? I would be, I get to actually do what I want. The question is how much do I get paid for it? That's the only thing that needs to be fixed in my life is I need more money coming in based on like doing what I love. But I'm not waiting to do what I love. I do it all the time, multiple times a week. Yeah. And that is so like, that's just night and day. That is a night and day experience to someone who like is just waiting for people to say yes. Um, And it keeps me sharp. It keeps me sane. It keeps me happy. So like in that sense, like they're really isn't enough gratitude for you like i love it i know that like other people who are on the outside are like that thing is a cult and it kind of is but whatever what does the writing area of your life look like that is basically all with mr zacharino um you do a group with him called animal we rebranded okay what is it okay (laughs) per my insistence zach and jess the zach and the jess the zach and the jess um yeah, Animal Rhymes, there were, like, too many things on YouTube that were, like, for children. So, what do you do through the Zack and the Jess? The Zack and the Jess is a musical comedy duo. Um, I would say we have, like, that has grown, and now we're writing more that isn't just that. But I would say, like, that's pr- predominantly, like, what we try to put out. Your videos life. are great. Thank you. There's, there's, everybody thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> everybody thinks so. <laughs> that guy, I just won the lottery. Like, that is a real match made in... Um, a special corner of comedy heaven. And you guys also do live musical improv together. Mm-hmm. Like you do, there's a show now. Magic called- to do Thursdays mm-hmm. at seven at sunset. And yeah, I mean like, I think he and I were both scheming to figure out how we could do musical improv. Like, you know, murder cliff was like scratching an itch, but it wasn't regular enough. We both had like guessed it with diamond line, but was like, <laughs> when can we just join? Like we just like wanted to do it so bad. And then when we got to do baby wants candy in Edinburgh this past summer, it was just like, I mean, I think, I don't want to speak too much for him, but I think we would both, like, say that we love it so You just much. fit together really well. We are just, yeah. And, and know how to yes and each other very well. Yeah, you know, that's, like, how I knew I wanted to write with him was, like, after performing with him for, like, a year in Murdercliffe, it was just, like, man, I keep playing twins with this guy. Like, I keep playing, like, people who can speak in unison. Like, we just have a significant overlap, and we have... A sp- there are, it does it's not 100% there are areas of our sense of humor that are not the same which I think make for an even stronger partnership because we have moments where he pulls me one way and where I pull us the other way that keep it I think varied and not just but yet have like allowed us to really like clarify a voice 
Um, and that I just appreciate his willingness to be silly, not to mention that he is, like, incredibly talented. Like, just, just so stupid talented. Um, so, yeah, most of my writing is with him. Uh, I have occasionally, like, tried to push myself to write something on my own, mostly to prove to myself that I can, so far, haven't done it. Like, except for writing my own character pieces. Like, um, you know, I've had a couple opportunities to be in, like, character showcases or things like that, so I want to make sure I have a stable of characters that are only written by me or, you know, like I'm doing for myself. But outside of that, I would say everything I'm writing currently is with the Zack and the Jess. And you said earlier that like, as you become more like emotionally present as you've grown up, uh, that you've also become more numb in other ways. Yeah. What are those ways? Um, I think allowing myself to, um, relish an accomplishment, you know, like, um, I feel like that period is getting shorter and shorter of, oh, I, you know, in early 2013, when I did comedy bang bang, I like couldn't stop grinning cause I was going to be on TV. Then when I did it later, it's like, this is great. Another day at the office, <laughs> you know, like, uh, still so exciting and so grateful, but like the sheer overwhelming feeling of like, ah, how is this even happening has gone away a little bit. And maybe because I'm like, well, it's happening because I'm working at it, which is maybe like a little cocky, but like, you know, I, I do have a little bit, Morgan is like, you have just kind of crazy blind confidence. Like, I don't know how I would do it if I didn't, which is just like, yeah, this is going to happen. Um, so you feel this is going to happen every day. Not every day, but sometimes it's delusion, but I think it's important delusion that keeps me, like, motivated and keeps me bold and uh, not scared about, like, is it going to happen? And just, like, it is going to happen. It's a matter of when and how and at what level. You know, like, but you will make your living this way, you know, and you will get the opportunities to create things eventually that you want. This will happen. Just keep working. So I think that I am a little numb to, like, allowing the success parts to, like, feel exciting, you know, like... You've built that numbness in as, <laughs> like, a strategy to help you go faster forward? <laughs> Maybe, consciously or not. But probably consciously, yeah. I think oh I've, like... <laughs> you know, just, like, everything... Amy Poehler talked about this in her book. Like, your career is not a mountain. There is no top. And I really feel that way. Like... I want to feel like I want to give myself that day or two to be like, you need to just be stoked. Just be happy that this happened to you. But it is very, it is getting faster and faster that I'm like, what's the next thing? And not like greediness, but just like, okay, no time for celebrating. So <laughs> what's the next thing that you'll really celebrate, that you'll have a grin on your face for, like, weeks and months. Series regular on a scripted TV show. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know if I... I don't have a vision board, but I guess I have, like, an internal one, I guess. That is, like, the mantra. That is the, like... That's the goal. Yeah, I feel like... <laughs> you... You feel, like, kind of like a machine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what my acting teacher warned me about you gotta just like be you gotta go three days without eating and then eat a steak he literally told me that and I was like that's not advice like I just I guess there is like a part of me that is a pragmatist which is just like how do I actually do it yeah and he's like I don't know you need to like fall in love and get your heart broken I'm like maybe that'll make me a better actor but I can't make that happen you know like how can I actually work on this and his answer was like basically you have all the other tools you need to like be coupling it with like an animal side of you that might not exist. <laughs> but I'm kind of at peace, like, with... I might never... But he was trying to make me, like, a great dramatic actor. Right. I just might you not You might not be, be in The Seagull. But yeah. But you're, like... But you might be in, like, The Seagull comedy. Yeah. I, and you know what? I think it's also, like, whatever. Like, kind of back to what you were saying earlier. Like, what is... Is, who really gets to be the arbiter of what is more authentic? Like, isn't it just as impressive that, like, I don't know, man. I just, like, it does make me mad that the Golden Globes don't nominate real comedies. You know, it's like, that's a stupid thing, but it is a real reflection of, like, this is hard. 
Like So maybe <laughs> In addition to making it, you can also try to change that. Change the world. Well, like, and no, I... No, just change the globes. Uh, yeah. The, the globe don't ones. change the globe. Just change the globes. <laughs> um, I love comedy. I love it so much. I think it's important. And... Why? It's just everything that we love. Like, it is that Sunday night with my brother and my dad. You know, like, that is important. It mattered to me. And that was, like, someone making jokes. And, like, that's... That's great. Like we'll go and ins- we'll go insane if we can't laugh at stuff. And like, I just do really feel like it has value. That's really cool. <laughs> I really love that answer. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> um. <laughs> um. So yeah, I I hope that I get good at that. You know. And how has so. Morgan, your fiance, soon to be your husband. Yeah, really his, soon. His goal, really, really soon, <laughs> about 30 days away. Ah. Uh, his goal is to be a writer. Mm-hmm. That, that's his whole goal, not just not to act too? No, he would like to act too. But he has, I guess it's sort of like what I think of like my sister is like he has the flip focus. Okay. So how does your relationship help each other day to day to to <laughs> towards these goals and in other ways? Um. I think it was a real, uh, it's always a real indication to me, or it's always real evidence and proof to me that I love him, that I feel like his goals are my goals. That like, you know, um, that, that real like ownership of someone else's happiness or not like, not that I think I can fully make him happy. Like, you know, I ultimately think that some, that has to come from a person, but that I can certainly be like, an an agent for happiness in his life and then I can be like someone who protects and guards his goals and his dreams and helps try to make them happen and I think that the level with which I think about that or that we talk about each other's goals is proof that I'm like feel good about our partnership um and that we really feel like a team but I would say we have very different senses of humor Um, I feel like we will never really collaborate on anything, um, except for maybe a Christmas movie. Um, (laughs) but that ultimately, like a lot of, a lot of times his reaction to my stuff is like, that's so crazy. (laughs) Like, I think my sense of humor is a lot weirder or I don't know, like, you know, maybe not that much different, but like. If he watches a Zach and the Jess video, he thinks it's funny and he appreciates that it's funny, but he's also like. That's so crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, which I think is good. And he he took like UCB classes, but it didn't like become his thing. And so there's an uh, there's a respect and appreciation. Like I never have to explain to him why I can't hang out because I have to go spend three hours in someone's living room with a bunch of other adults making stuff up <laughs> yeah. in front of one person on a couch that we're going to pay to be there. You know, that's so weird if you aren't a part of this world. So, you know, he's so proud and encouraging and gets it, but also we aren't stepping on each other's toes. We aren't like, um, and obviously like, obviously couples can exist in the community who are both in the community and it doesn't step on each other's toes. But it is, like, for us, I think it might be helpful that we have, like, a little bit of a separation. Yeah. Um, who makes each other... Who... Does one of you make the other one laugh more? <laughs> um, I think he makes me laugh more than I make him laugh. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, or we fall into, like, a, a communal bit, you know, like... Yeah. We are both feeding this bit. <laughs> But I'd say it's pretty rare that me solo would make him laugh. I feel like his appreciation of my humor is sometimes a little more objective than subjective. He's like, oh, you're a star. I don't always get it, but you're a damn star. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't most people's parents tell them that? <laughs> <laughs> my parents do. <laughs> a lot of people just get, I don't get it. My, yeah. <laughs> my parents do too. Yeah, yeah. We're very lucky. We're very lucky. Oh my gosh. I just... <laughs> Oh my god, I recently got to do a part on Hot Wives of Vegas, also straight through UCB, which was very fun. But it meant I had to miss a day of Coachella, and that really sent me into a real whiny baby spiral. Uh And Morgan had to just kind of, like, listen to me whine about it. 
And then when it was over and it was no big deal to come late to Coachella and I had such a blast shooting Hot Wives. And obviously that's such a cool thing to do that keeps you from doing something cool that isn't necessary. is like completely frivolous. I was like, which is how I often feel, but like, I can't complain ever. Why would I ever complain about anything? My <laughs> life is like so great. And I, anytime I am not grateful, I'm being a total jerk. <laughs> well, that's a very good attitude. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just, it's a little like comical. I am like, I'm, I have an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, have a lovely day. <laughs> have a lovely day. <laughs> for someone to feel something that you So, listeners, on the cuspers, thank you so much for listening to my interview with Jess McKenna. If you want to see Jess perform live, you can see her at UCB Franklin almost every Monday night with her Herald team, Dunk Tank. And I think she gave the time for her musical improv group, Magic to Do, in her interview, but I'll say it again anyway. That team does shows every Thursday night at 7 o'clock at UCB Sunset. If you like this episode of On the Cusp, I hope you'll consider listening to others and possibly rating or reviewing us on iTunes. Special thanks to the band Hi Ho Silvero and Casey Triela for all the music in this episode, to my sound editor Joe Burge, and to my producer Cece, I can have fun playing him in Towerfall, Pierce. This has been On the Cusp. Be nee, be nee, be nee, be nee, be nee. That's your outro music.